Doctrine of Absolute Morality Narrated by Phil Richmond Is there a moral absolute? Is there a line between good and evil? Can justice be put on a scientific, therefore, objective basis? Is morality quantifiable? Because if not, it would seem discussions on morality are nonsensical. There is no way for humans to divide anything in anything resembling an objective way without it being quantifiable. In other words, only when the factor being discussed can be turned into two different strands, one numerically positive and the other numerically negative, can it be said the result is an absolute. Virtually every issue that confounds humanity hinges on the possibility there is a right answer to moral problems. The possibility there is a right answer implies the existence of a moral absolute. Moral absolutes hinge on the quantification of morality. Questions concerning the immorality of slavery and the objectionableness of racism, as well as demands for stronger gender rights, assume a right answer exists, and this right answer is beyond the chance of a violent mob. Even the concept of a right answer, assumes right answers reside within an objective morality. Despite this, many of those demanding a moral response assume there are no moral absolutes. Those who express absolute moral rhetoric still say there is no fundamental difference between right and wrong. They may even claim, in a different context, that no one has a right to impose their moral vision on anyone else which smacks of hypocrisy. But the arguments against the existence of objective morality are put forward because liberals believe making moral arguments to support a moral position is morally wrong. Arguing that evil people go to hell is a moral argument that ought not be made, according to liberals. The existence of heaven and hell impose a moral absolute or moral standard on people who do not wish to live by this standard. Condemning people for immorality offends morality because having a moral standard is immoral in the liberal worldview. For many liberals the only moral standard is moral relativity. The one thing we cannot do, as moral human beings, liberals say, is assume how you live is fundamentally right. Liberals assert they do not object to people believing in God, so long as the belief is not touted as preferable to atheism. Morality is good, in other words, so long as it does not impose standards and principles on the believer. It is impossible to criticize another person's position without thinking one's position is the better one. Therefore, say liberals, being critical of another person is immoral. To condemn an argument on the grounds the position defended requires a moral judgment is in fact a moral argument. The person who argues there are no sound metaphysical arguments is making a metaphysical argument he thinks is sound. The person who claims only empirically validated statements are true disproves the claim he is making, because the claim made is not empirically validated, nor can it be empirically validated. One cannot test every statement empirically. If statements could be empirically tested the results would be inconclusive, as the empirical method never produces absolute moral truths. The stalemate between those who espouse moral absolutes are possible, and those who claim moral relativism is the only valid position, exists because neither side has maintained a consistent position. Moral relativists speak in the same terms as those who hold to moral absolutes. However, it is also true that those who claim they speak for moral absolutism talk as if moral relativism was a morally virtuous position. This confusion is due at least in part to confusing morality and ethics. They are not the same. If moral relativists make statements that are moral absolutist, 
Those who claim to be moral absolutists often speak in terms that reflect a cultural relativist position. There is either a right and wrong or there is moral relativism. These are mutually exclusive categories. Law cannot bridge the gap. They cannot be alternated according to need. Because moral absolutes are not acceptable in this world and moral relativism lacks substance, the question is how to impose moral boundaries on human behavior without resorting to moral absolutism? If relativism does not permit for regulatory frameworks to be imposed and no one wants moral absolutes to be imposed, how do we control the masses? The answer has always been, from the dawn of time, by the use of force. It's a pragmatically sound response, though it lacks philosophical elegance. The government uses stronger and better armed men to control the actions of weaker, less well-armed and organized persons. The state creates justice systems to regulate human interactions. Law gives subjects the impression that justice is objective. The rich and powerful are arrested for begging on the streets and for vagrancy as readily as the homeless poor. But if moral truths are relative, what ought the state to regulate? It is easy to say murder is wrong, but reality rarely permits simple answers. Even slavery spans the gamut from chattel slavery to penal servitude to community service. Where do we draw the line and what qualifications do we consider important when dealing with real-world issues? Slavery is wrong in the form we think is wrong, but there is no line that slavery has crossed. There is no single definition under the law for murder. We say things are morally wrong, but in the end what matters is if they are legally wrong or not. If a criminal is killed to save an innocent person's life, we consider this an acceptable loss of life. It is also okay to lie to save a person from being made a victim. If we know this is true, the knowledge is based on a greater moral truth existing. A moral truth higher than the legal system or any application of the moral law exists if the particular is to be qualified by the general. The law we follow is not moral law. We know the actions of Athenian nobility and Nazi bureaucrats were wrong, though legal. Both Greek and German, despite being civilized, failed to live up to a universal and absolute sense of how we ought to live. We do not absolve people of their moral failures, though everything they did was legal. That what they did was legal only serves to bring the law into disrepute. The certainty we have concerning moral rights and wrong permit us to judge the law. Some people think mankind is justified morally to judge the actions of God. Liberals make many claims about the injustice, inhumanity, and outright cruelty of God. It is not that they are right or wrong in their estimations, but that they feel they have the moral virtue to judge God. This is a monstrously huge assumption to make. Do we have sufficient moral virtue to judge another person, let alone God? The Bible tells us judge not lest ye be judged. We are told we are judged by the same measure meted out. What is the difference between saying a child ought not eat too many sweets and saying God treated Job inhumanely? In both cases we think we are the heir to a moral code that transcends all persons and systems and even is above God himself. But how can God be subject to a moral truth? It is prima facie an absurd position to take. But if we cannot logically criticize God on moral grounds, how do we judge the law and the state on moral grounds? Where does the idea of a moral truth greater than God come from? The only way moral truth can be greater than God is if there is no God. If there is no God, we are free to critique a particular narrative describing a particular idea of God. 
If there is a God, no morality can exceed his own nature. The belief that moral absolutes are of a higher category of existence than God assumes that moral absolutes have a source other than God. Morality needs to be a higher order of existence than God if moral truths permit us to critique God. After all, if both man and God are subject to the moral law, man and God are on the same plane of existence. Moral absolutes cannot be divorced from absolutism. Absolutes must be granted existence before one can postulate the existence of a moral absolute. But the very acceptance of the existence of absolutes pushes us into the territory of metaphysics and God. Which reminds us again that neither a moral relativist nor a moral absolutist has taken a consistent position on the topic of moral truth. If moral absolutes exist, law cannot have final authority. Legal systems have no validity in a world of moral absolutes. It is not possible for law to reign supreme in a land where moral absolutes critique the law and how it is applied or not enforced. We already critique legal systems. BLM was an exercise in moral virtue. BLM was founded on a belief in moral absolutes and the right of the citizen to hold their culture to account. Slavery was defeated not because it was illegal, but because it was deemed immoral. However, when the law is open to the moral scrutiny of subjects it has lost its regulatory authority. If we are governed purely by moral virtue legal systems become passé and of no merit. If morality exists, and no one can claim it does not without contradicting themselves, legal systems must be shelved. Liberals turn moral relativity into a moral absolute when they claim there are no moral absolutes. Cultural relativity is the claim that all cultures are equally valid. As with most of what the left claims, this is a contradiction of terms. Only cultures that admit they are of no special value are good cultures. Meaning cultural relativists possess the best and most perfect culture. The arguments of liberals are always contradictory. Indeed, the entire left is an oxymoron. The very relativism of the left and its claim that conservatism is bad is tantamount to a testament to the value of conservatism. If everything is relative and freedom the ultimate value, the left's critique of the right contravenes its own principles. The right may be exclusionary in its beliefs, but at least its arguments are coherent. Legalists claim it is immoral to murder, but qualify the statement and the regulations outlawing it with exceptions. The simple rule, murder is wrong, is qualified by listing degrees of severity and different forms of murder, such as first and second degree. The law recognizes different extenuating circumstances, even to permitting cold-blooded murder, at least when done by an abused woman. The law, in its wisdom, has decreed some abused women are left with no other avenue of escape but murder. The problem the moral absolutists have is that the law insists all moral law be expressed verbally. Yet, it is obvious, it is impossible to create a law that expresses a moral absolute. No written law can consider every possible situation and circumstance. This problem of translating absolutes into legalese has become especially problematical when dealing with illegal drugs. It seems that creating new forms of drugs is easier than the process followed to make them illegal. Indeed, how does one make something that does not yet exist illegal? Can we outlaw crimes that have not yet happened and incarcerate the person before the crime has been committed? Does morality exist if it must be expressed in ethical terms? Is the doctrine of absolute morality nothing more than a desire to see well-written law? 
or as appears to be required by the definition of the word, are moral absolutes a mode of deciding right and wrong? The question asked here, to be clear, is if moral absolutes are the same as an ethical code? This is an inherently contradictory position, or are moral absolutes a way of deferring to the better option when there are competing possibilities? We know murder is wrong, but there are varied situations in which the death of a person results. There are an unlimited number of conditions within which the murder happens. Is all of this irrelevant when considering a killing of a person? Is it always an eye for an eye and a life for a life? But if moral absolutes are not defined by rules, such as those given above, then a moral absolute is really more about principles. Morality does not tell us lying is wrong or murder is wrong. Morality tells U.S. murder is wrong because it conflicts with a moral principle. It is not the action or act that is wrong, it is the consequence. The moral absolute is not the stricture against murder, it is the underlying principle which the act tends to violate. Morality gives rise to ethics, not the other way around. This is what so many commentators seem to not grasp. We will not arrive at morality by seeking to compact ethical codes into one meta rule. There is no meta-ethical statement that will morph into a moral statement. Murder is morally wrong because of the nature of morality not because there is an ethical rule making murder illegal. Murder is wrong morally because it offends morality not because it breaks an ethical injunction. This is the key to understanding morality. Ethical strictures do not solve moral problems, they are the problem. Ethical rules are invalid unless there is an authority willing and able to enforce them. The key figure in any ethical system is the judiciary. Morality is centered on community. The moral individual is a fiction. He or she is moral because of his or her willingness to live in a moral community. We have already established that morality is not derived from the law or ethical codes. Thus, the individual is not the true moral guardian. This is why we are not to judge one another. The individual does not have the means to impose morality on others. To attempt such a thing only marks us as hypocrites. We are capable of imposing an ethical code on subjects, not a moral code. The moral code requires a community, not a person in a position of power. This is a problem for liberals who put a lot of faith in experts. But morality is not about expertise. It is about who owns what and who has a right to define the value of what is created. The church is the moral unit, not the individual or the state. This is because morality is tied to value, to the ultimate good, which is to create value, and through this to be of value. The first order principle or purpose of man is to be of use, to create value, and be of value. To this we need to have faith. If we are ruled by fear we will not produce value or be of much use. This has a corollary in civilization. To have faith is to create the church. The church manifested in faith is civilization. The church is a civil society governed by faith. Fear destroys value. This is why we are told to have faith. If we do not have faith in the people of God, how can we claim we have faith in Christ? We are to create value, but to do this we must have faith in one another. Our faith or works of faith are manifested as civilization. We create value and the value we create can be tabulated. In contrast those who are evil consume value without compensating the community for the value consumed. This suggests they are motivated by fear. They do not think investments will be protected nor rewarded, 
so they focus on taking what they can, while giving as little as they must. The fearful build up treasures on earth. Those who have faith trust those with faith to provide what is needed. It is through the faithful that Jesus works. Jesus told us that those who feed the hungry, house the homeless and care for the sick do it for him. Those who do not have faith purchase insurance. If we had faith in our neighbors, we would not need insurance. Jesus works through the community, not individuals. We are the church. I am not the church. You are not the church. The greatest fear that has always plagued Christians is exposure to people who may betray them. We fear divesting ourselves of wealth because we fear being betrayed. We do not trust the people of God. They are too likely to be proven to be wolves in sheep clothing. Some have taken the plunge and given away what they had. This is admirable, but it does not fully reflect the words of Jesus. We are to do works of faith with the wealth we have been given. We are not to throw pearls before swine, and while surely this refers to the word of God, it must also apply to what we do in response to these words. A work of faith must be performed in accordance to the wisdom of God. We are to sell what we have and give the proceeds to the poor. It makes more sense to sell what we have to the church, to the people of God, as a community of believers in the service of God, than to enrich the world with what we have. After all, we are to do good works and care for our own. To divest ourselves of our wealth by giving it to secularists seems inconsistent with other responsibilities that we have. To sell to the church there has to be a community of believers. This is a paradox. We cannot sell to the church if it does not exist, and it cannot exist until we have as believers divested ourselves of our wealth. It is the ones who follow Christ who are believers, not the ones who mouth the words of Scripture. So, assuming we have twenty believers all of whom own assets, who is the church since these believers must sell what they have to take up their cross? The answer is hidden in the statement made before about the nature of the church. The church is the community of believers, not individuals. Believers sell what they have to the entity representing the faith of the community. A church is a place of faith, representing the faith of the believer in a corporate way. To permit faith to be expressed fully believers must create a being of faith, a corporate entity created out of faith. This is what the Bible refers to as a church. Faith-based organizations are the legal form of the church. The church is the face the faithful present to the world. The church is a legal entity in the eyes of the world and takes the form of a trust or a not-for-profit charitable corporation. It is through this body that the church becomes a light to the world. The members of the church own the church as shareholders. Each member holds one common or voting share. All commercial property is sold to the trust in exchange for shares issued by the church backed by the assets owned by the church or trust. These shares are preferred shares and represent the equity of the church. Property with a commercial value of $30,000 becomes 30,000 units of equity. Each unit of equity is issued as a preferred share. These shares serve as a unit of account. Preferred shares have no value, they merely tell members the state of the member's account. Each member has an account with the trust. The account is credited with a balance of 30,000 prefers, of units of account denominated in preferred share units, or prefers. Prefers, a contraction of preferred shares, symbolized by, are the accounting unit used by the a priori church. Cash cards or paper currency can be issued on the value of the equity of the trust. 
Thus, prefers serves as a medium of exchange and store of value for church members. If a crime is committed by a member, the church adjudicates the penalty. This is a process that determines the cost created by the offense. It is morally necessary to create value and immoral to destroy value. Justice is the activity of restoring value back to the plaintiff from the account of the accused. Penalties can be quantified and adjudicated without the need for legal systems. A plaintiff accuses the defendant of creating an illicit and unwarranted cost, and the court determines if a cost has been created and the value lost. The court also imposes a means of restitution on the defendant. What this means is that through the church society has a clear line of demarcation between good and evil and between profit and loss. Through the church morality is made absolute. Creating value for the church is an absolute good. Harming the church and the body of Christ by causing values to be destroyed or loss is wrong and must be corrected. Because values can and are quantified and can and are established for all acts of creation and destruction, the exercise of justice can be put on a scientific therefore quantifiable basis.